Welcome to the Future Champions webinar with Shane Stefanuto in what I believe will be a very good session on the journey of sport. Whether you play um, sport for fun or you have bigger dreams, your journey in sport will be incredible, filled with highs and lows, but ultimately rewarding. I'd like to thank Shane for taking the time out of his day to share some insights with us. Shane, welcome to the Future Champions webinar. Hi, everyone. Hi, Stuart. All right, before we get started on your topic, Shane, I just wanted to tell our listeners a little bit about you. Uh, Shane grew up in Cairns, Queensland, and at the age of 15, made the move to Brisbane to follow his footballing dream. At the age of 16, he received a scholarship with the Queensland Academy of Sport. He was then selected to play for the Brisbane Strikers in the National Soccer League, League before moving to Norway to play football. At the age of 29, Shane returned back to Australia to play for North Queensland, but suffered an ACL injury early in the first season. Exactly 10 years and one day to this day, Shane signed for the Brisbane Raw. He would go on to be part of one of the most successful A-League teams in history, winning two premierships and three championships. After retiring from professional football, Shane rejoined Queen, uh, Brisbane Raw as an administrator and is working there. And I think you're in the office today, Shane. So welcome. Um, and before we uh, go on to, like I said, to your topic, I just wanted to say what an incredible journey you've had with football. Yeah, it was fortunate and privileged um, to have such a long professional career. Um, Travelled the world. Um, I've experienced some highs, some massive highs and some really low lows. Um, I've met amazing people and I'm thankful uh, for what football has given me. And, and I'm also thankful that uh, I continue to be able to work in football. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm the current football director of the Brisbane Royal Football Club. Uh, when I retired as a footballer at 36 and a half years old, I went into a media manager role. I then transitioned to a head of corporate affairs. And then my dream job was always to be a football director or a general manager. And that's what I'm, I'm doing to this day, which is uh, I enjoy every day. It's different every day and I'm learning every day. Today's topic will go on the same theme as we've been going with our webinars. There are four uh, categories of the athlete. And in a simple form, we have the body, which is often referred to as physicality. This is the athlete's physical presence, endurance, speed and agility. Then you have doing. It's the technical or technique and skill uh, for each sport, and it's very different for each sport. Thinking about doing, that's, um, that's how, whether you, uh, do you understand your sport and your role in it? What is your game plan or tactics? People with a good game awareness see the game unfold before it happens. Then there is thinking, confidence, focus, composure, intensity, and trust. If we can improve these areas, we improve the athletic performance. Uh, this is what we refer to as our mindset or our mind. Um, and then that sort of explains it. So we have that thinking concept and the mind or mind tough or mind strength sits around that. So Shane, from your perspective, how, were, how important was a strong mindset in your sporting journey? It's extremely important. I mean, um, some people would say that professional sport is maybe 80% mental and 20% physical. Now, I don't 100% agree with that, but um, overcoming um, setbacks, um, dealing with pressure um, you need to be able to I guess develop this skill um, and it is a skill um, it's something that I think over time you get better and better at um, it's not something that any of us I guess just instinctively have um, in our locker and I, I think it's, it's, it's good that as we um, come up to hurdles or challenges um, we, we get through those challenges but we learn from what, we, what we've done and, um, and, and we hope and we always hope that it makes us bigger and better and a, and a better sports person, I would say. So we're talking about today, particularly in our mindset, is the journey in sport. That's the key theme. Um, sport is a journey that everyone has um, or everyone's at a different stage in their life or development. But there are stages of that journey that can be categorised into the following. And they are fun, challenge, elite and excellence. And to give you an understanding of those, you can see them on, you should be able to see them on the screen. So fun, this is an athlete, this is the athlete who plays sport for fun and friendship. Training and outcomes are not as important as connecting with people. So Shane, similar to mini ruse or uh, competitive, um, non-competitive football or social football at the age of 30, that's the sort of ages we're talking about, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is. And it's even at, at, at local junior level is just enjoying your football. You know, my son is a point in case. That he's not a SAT player. Um, he probably isn't of that standard yet, but he enjoys his football. He loves getting out there with his mates. He loves being active. And, and for me as a dad, I'm very proud of him for, for just enjoying uh, what he's doing. But, um, you know, that would be what I class as that, that fun uh, social football. And as we move up the pyramid, we have challenge. And this is the athlete who takes their sport more seriously and is usually connected to a club, a local club. And um, they enjoy competing, training, and like the feeling of winning. I guess, Shane, this is your local clubs. And when players start to get into the grittiness and understanding what winning means. Yeah, I don't think there's any human being that doesn't enjoy winning. I'd, I'd like to meet one that doesn't. And uh, I guess that, you know, that's the, that's the sports person or the person that's, um, you know, have, I think has the ability to be elite um, and go to the next level. But sometimes, um, for whatever reason, don't probably get to where they, where they wanted to go, but still um, are, are talented in their own right. And then elite, we go up the, the pyramid a little bit more. This is the athlete who has a desire to progress in their sport and have made a regional team, a state representative team, or an academy squad like the Brisbane Roar Academy. They train as part of a squad, take ownership of their own development outside of organised training, and are really committed uh, to either holding that elite status or progressing on to the next level. Yeah, this is the sports person that, you know, realistically is dedicating a great deal of their, their life um, to their chosen sport or sports. Um, you know, they would be uh, training or playing nearly every day of the week, I would think. It would be, um, uh, they would be dedicated to what they're doing and, 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 and they would have to have a holistic approach in what they're doing to, to, to be successful or, or to try and be as, um, as successful as they possibly can be. And then we move to the pointy end of the spear. Uh, this is the professional athlete or an athlete that represents their national team. Um, it's certainly, uh, for example, a professional player from Brisbane Raw or overseas. Uh, this is, I guess, the area where a lot of young kids want to be. Yeah, and it's great to be striving to be the top of the pyramid. Um, as we see, as we go up, um, it gets smaller and smaller. And, and that probably is a point that we must make is that uh, the percentage of sports people that make it into an excellence or an elite um, program is very small. Um, I think in the A-League at the moment, there's 11 teams, 20 contracted players, 220 players in the whole of Australia. So I'm, I'm sure in our academy program, we probably have 110 uh, junior footballers at the moment that are all looking to aspire to be a Brisbane or footballer one day. So you can, you can understand that the percentage that do make it um, is only small, but um, I think it's important that we all give our, ourselves the um, best possible chance to, to make it to the top. It's also important to note that each part of your sporting journey is rewarding in itself and you don't have to be an elite athlete or, or um, attain that area of excellence to find value at to find value in it. Yeah, correct, correct. correct. And, and look, if I can add to that is, is that with the pyramid, the way it is, is, is that being involved in sport is great in itself. It, I, I believe it's great for uh, mental, mental health, to be honest, and, and your general health. And I think wherever we end up, we've just got to be knowing that uh, we give ourselves the best shot at, at going to where we want to be and also enjoying what we're doing which is as as a sports person that i was i loved football and i still love football to this day and no matter what level of football i still play i, I love getting out there and I, I guess now it's time to ask and this is our first we're going to trust the uh technological gods here shane and ask a poll question and the poll question that we are asking is where are you in your journey now and where do you want to be? And again, fun, challenge, elite or excellence. So we are going to try and open up our first poll. And let's launch the poll. So you should have up there the first question. So where are you now in your sporting journey? You hit the one, the one that best describes you, then press next. Once you've done that, you then hit the next question, where do you want to be? And then if you hit where you want to be, and then you submit. 
So that should make perfect question. We've had our first question. Um, and it is from uh, Alex. And he says, how important have your coaches been to your development as a football player? Very good question, Alex. Um, I think each coach uh, that I had along the way uh, played an important role. Um, I'm a big believer in every coach that I had. I tried to learn something off them or, or, or become a better player because of them. Um, along the way, I had many excellent coaches. And um, from the start, which was in far north Queensland, Edge Hill, my local club, uh, Steve Davies, he was probably my first most influential coach that gave me that bit of, uh, I guess, uh, developed me as, as a footballer and, and saw something in me, which, which was good for confidence. Um, I obviously, my first Queensland Academy of Sport coach, Gary Phillips, was also influential in, in, in having that belief in me and, and I guess harnessing mm, the raw talent that I had. And um, I will never forget my first professional coach, well, when I signed my first professional deal at the Brisbane Strikers, John Cosmina, who probably... Uh, turned me from a boy into a man. Um, he was very um, hard on us young players, which at the time I thought was was quite confronting, actually. But um, made me, when we talk about mental toughness, uh, that was the start of uh, my journey, uh, probably as an 18-year-old, to be honest. And it it did um, prepare me well for the for the years ahead. Um, I then go along the way, and I've had Graham Arnold um, as a national team coach, who was who was excellent in, in getting me prepared for game day. Um, and then, obviously, you know, here in Australia, Ange Postacoglu I had in Brisbane at the Brisbane Roar and we were so successful together. And um, he was like a father at the time. You know, he was, he was just uh, unbelievable in, in uh, making us bulletproof, really. And, and we all bought into what he was, um, was, was wanting us to achieve. And, 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 and so that was, they were great, great times. And... Look, along the way, I've also had Mike Mulvey, who I won a championship through, who was, who was important. John Aloisi, who I, who I finished my career with about, you know, professional standards. And John, as a player, was unbelievable. And as a coach, he was, he was very, um, very good at, at those standards. And to this day, where right now, you know, um, our head coach is Robbie Fowler. And so I get to experience the player um, I played with, with Robbie at North Queensland Fury. And now I get to see him as a manager. And I... I, I um, have learned a lot about um, how relaxed he is as a man, um, how good he is at man management. Um, and that's probably something all, all coaches, I believe, um, you know, can get better at. And, and it's a big part of the, uh, of the dynamic of, of a team sport, you know, is, is, is you can't paint everyone with the same brush. You can't treat everyone uh, the same. You need to work out how, how to get the best out of each and every individual so the team uh, succeeds. But um, very good question, Alex. Fantastic. So our poll is now ending and I'll put up the results. So it's very interesting that when you look at this, Shane, that uh, there's a lot of players or a lot of people in this, um, in this webinar that are elite players. So I assume that a couple of your um, Brisbane Royal Academy players probably logged on to hear what you've got to say, which is great. And then you can see down the bottom that was it, 86% want to be in that excellence uh, point in, in, the, in the pointy end of the, um, uh, of, of, of the spear. And it's, it's probably worth notice, noting in this, um, I guess, in this poll, is that it's not just about wanting to be at a place of excellence. There's a lot of hard work that has to go with it as well, isn't there? Ah, oh, there is, there is, and I mean, if you if you're not willing to hard to to work hard, then then you might as well stop straight away. It's it's wonderful to see um, so many of you uh, wanting to get to the top of the pyramid. It, it's it's wonderful, and I and I encourage you all to keep believing in that and and keep striving for that. I, I think it's wonderful to see that um, we we all have to be ambitious. We all have to be motivated uh, to succeed and and hungry to do that. So um, yeah, no, it's it's great to see. And, and Shane, from your perspective, um, what, you've, what you wanted to communicate in today's webinar is that not all journeys are the same. Uh, different roads can lead to the same destination, and that's true in life as well as sport. Um, Shane, you're going to share with us uh, three stories about Brisbane Raw. Is that, is that right? Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and I, I wanted to say, look, when I was coming through the system, let's say, there was probably only 
realistically a, a, a pathway that you had to take to become um, into, into that um, elite uh, sphere of, of sports person. Um, I'm really encouraged that in today's uh, sporting world, uh, there are many different ways to get to the same end point, which is to be a professional sports person, let's say, if that's what we want to do. And I think it's, we have to be all um, understanding and mindful that if you don't make it at one path, um, you don't have to give up. You know, there are other pathways that you can take uh, to be successful and, and reach the top. And if we look at the, um, the, the first example is what we class as the textbook example. And this is a, junior de um, a person whose junior development followed the football pathway pretty much textbook. And, and do you want to share with us who that raw player is? Yeah, I think you couldn't get a better example than this person. And it, it's, you know, Matt Mackay, um, my captain, um, uh, you know, a great leader, um, but someone that I would think uh, in, a, in a perfect world uh, took the near perfect pathway. He came through the Queensland Academy of Sport, um, which was like the NYL or the youth league program we have now. Um, he then transitioned into the Brisbane Strikers as a young footballer and made his um, professional debut as a, young, as a youngster. Um, he obviously then went on um, to play for the Brisbane Raw in the A-League um, and very successful at it, captained the club, won championships. Um, then as a footballer, um, never stopped trying to improve and was very motivated to do that. And, and then obviously tried his luck overseas. Um, and, and for Matt, went to Scotland, went to Rangers, probably not as successful as he would have hoped, but that didn't stop him and, and pioneered into Asia and in, in South Korea and, uh, and China. And, and, and along the way, obviously made, you know, 59 caps for his country. And, and for a guy, he's only a small little fella, but when you talk about mental strength, uh, hunger, competitiveness, uh, there's not many uh, better than, than Matt McCoy, but did take what you would call or what I would con call in my role now the perfect pathway. Okay, the next category or the next category of, uh, I guess, uh, journey is the stumble, which refers to a player that has progressed through the pathway, but then for one reason or another received a setback and then had to overcome that setback to, I guess, get back on the road to success and move into that excellence um, pathway or space. Yeah, I, I get to see this guy nearly every day, Dylan Wenzel Halls, and uh, I'm really proud of him, actually, because um, he's a great lad. Um, but Dylan was in our system, which was our part of our Y League program, our Youth League program. Didn't progress to earning himself a professional contract the first time. Uh, went back to NPL Queensland land, went back with Western, uh, Western Pride, and absolutely dominated. Uh, never stopped working hard. Um, you know, was really a standout. You know, I think the year before we signed him on a pro deal, I think he had something like 20, 20 odd goals in 10 games. You know, I think for Dylan, never gave up. You know, was in the system, went out of the system. Um, but, but he wants to, as a player each and every day now, he wants to keep improving and he wants to keep getting better. And I think for Dylan now, he also is not just happy to be an A-League player, I think his next pathway is to go overseas and, and, again, continue to try and play for national teams. He's done that at under-23 level now, but probably play senior national teams. And I'm sure it's his goal um, to play overseas one day, which I believe if he keeps working hard, um, he's got the ability to do. How easy would it have been for him to, to after being released from the Brisbane Roar as a youth player and go into the National Premier League, which is the tier below, uh, to feel a sense of rejection and maybe not recover from that and have a poor season. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, he, he could have he could have packed it in. Let's be honest. He could have said, "No, nah, that's too hard for me." And remember, when he went out of our system, I think going back to Western Pride and no slight to them, but they would have been uh, semi-professional. They would have been training potentially three nights a week. They would have had a game on the weekend from let's say March to September. Um, you know, not full-time professional. So he would have had to be self-motivated. He would have had to be, as you spoke about before, he would have been having to do extra training work 
um, extra finishing practice. He would have had to look after his own diet, his own sleep patterns, his own weekly preparation so that he could be uh, performing on a weekend. He wouldn't have had the support that he probably would have had at the Brisbane Raw, but he didn't he didn't make that as an excuse and he continued on and he and he's getting his rewards now. And then the, the next player, um, and you might want to check your notes on this one, but this is the late arrival. There's a theory in football that if you haven't made, or at any sport, that if you haven't been identified by 13 or 14, then you never will. And we often hear that, uh, particularly overseas. And the, But this is not true. So many young athletes only start growing into their bodies around 15, 16 or 17. So who is an example to you, Shane, of a player uh, that I guess made a representative team in those sort of 15, 16, 17 years? I guess this is my story, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm very, uh, I'm very pleased that I get the opportunity um, to share my story because, um, like we've mentioned, born and bred in far north Queensland, uh, with very supportive parents, um, started playing football as a five-year-old, um, was also always reasonably talented. Um, you get to that, I guess, period of a junior football career at 12, let's say, when you start making representative sides. Um, for, for people on here, they might understand, but being a part of a far north Queensland squad is sometimes quite difficult because when you come south to the Brisbane teams, you tend to struggle because of the gap in, in, in class, let's call it. Um, so for myself, at 12, 13, 14, 15, um, I was not making Queensland teams. I was probably not even making shadow sides for a Queensland select. Um, I was small. Um, and as we know, as young men, we all develop, develop at different times. Um, again, but along the way, um, I didn't give up. I, I, I continued to work hard. And, and I'm very thankful that um, my parents probably made the ultimate sacrifice for me. And in uh, 1995, decided to move south, move to southeast Queensland and, and set up base um, on the Gold Coast. Now, I must give you some information that they chucked in their jobs. They both chucked in their jobs for me. Um, my sister had to relocate school. She was just going into year eight. And they did all that for my, for my I guess, my football career. Um, for me, but making most of the opportunity and repaying my family was always in the back of my mind. And um, in 1996, I probably had the most um, influential, beneficial, uh, best year of my career junior career let's call it where I really kicked on um, I developed physically um, I was my football was was going in the right direction and obviously by September 96 I'd been offered a, a scholarship at the Queensland Academy of Sport and remember at this time the NPL land and things like that weren't as strong so the local league was not as as good as it is now um, so for me I was lucky that 96 was probably the most crucial year of of me becoming a professional footballer. And I was lucky enough to have, have a coach, as I already said, in Gary Phillips and Mike Mulvey, who, who really moulded me as a footballer, um, turned me into a left back that I ended up um, playing the rest of my career in that position, which was, which was great. Um, and I guess from there on, it just was all fell into line for me. I, I, I progressed from QAS to QAS, year after year and then I've eventually made my um, National Soccer League debut in 1998 as an 18 year old so um, I mean getting there was was just the start of my journey um, obviously I, I, I started I stayed in the NSL or the old A-League as, as we would call it until I was 23 24 uh, progressed then next challenge was to go overseas and play in Europe and I played in Norway for five five and a half six seasons um, to, to the point where in between that I, I started to uh, represent my country on a number of occasions and obviously uh, playing uh, European football is a dream for, for all uh, young, young, young footballers. So um, I guess I, I, I just want to mainly let people know that, you know, if you're not at the best or the top of the tree at 12 or 13 or 14 or 15. Um, it, it's not a time for alarm or panic. Um, look, it all evens out over time. And as we've just seen, you know, some footballers or sportsmen will take the, take the, 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 the road that's simplest. Um, others will take a more um, different road. And someone like myself takes a unique pathway. But we all get to where we want to go, which is excellence. And um, 
And, and that's where, at the moment, like I'm saying, we're, we're very um, young sports people uh, are very blessed uh, that they have more than one way to make it to the top. So we, on that note, you mentioned Norway and Matthew Becker has a question. Keep those questions coming. He's asked, how do you feel you developed as a player in Norway? And I guess, can I add to that? How did you develop as a person as well? Because going overseas is a significant experience for anyone. You know, the first day, uh, you know, I get off a plane, Cairns boy, don't forget, you know, been in Cairns 80% of my life. And I fly into Oslo uh, International Airport and it is snowing. There is snow everywhere. Um, my tr first training session was on artificial um, grass and it was probably minus five degrees. Layers, uh, you know, probably physically the hardest, and I was going into pre-season then, probably the hardest pre-season that I've ever done in my life. You know, double sessions every day, gym programs, et cetera, et cetera, and all in a foreign country, uh, like Stuart has mentioned, you know, uh, unable to speak language, not having family around. I was lucky that I was supported by my, my wife who, who moved over around three months after I, I began, but I was really um, there by myself. I had one Australian um, footballer that was in my team, Casey Wehrman, um, who to this day I'm still thankful for, for guiding me and helping me along the way. And uh, yeah, at the time as a Cairns boy, it's, it's, a, it's an eye opener. Um, it's an eye opener to be in a, in a, like I said, a foreign country. Uh, but as young footballers and all you young, young sports people out there that have the opportunity, we all want to progress to the, to the best possible leagues. And I think as a young Australian at the time, and this was around the 2000s, I wanted to play in the Premier League. That was, was my dream. I knew that I wasn't probably good enough to play in the Premier League, or obviously I wasn't good enough, but that didn't stop me from trying to take a direction where I could get there. And my, my goal was to play in Scandinavia for a season or two, then transfer across to England, either First Division, Championship, even, even uh, League One, and then hopefully one day uh, be good enough to play in one of the top leagues in Europe. Unfortunately, easier said than done, but I had an enjoyable um, uh, six seasons in Norway. I, I, I mean, it was, a, it was an outstanding uh, learning experience for me. And it was also, I don't believe I would have represented my country um, if I hadn't made that, made that move uh, to play in Scandinavia in, in Europe. And look, I can't undersell, you know, Norwegian football, very physically de demanding, very tough, very skillful. But also, I got opportunities to play against Newcastle United um, at St. James's Park in the what it used to be called the Intertoto Cup. Um, so, you know, there was, there was along the way, there was some, some outstanding um, opportunities and, 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 and challenges, you know, to play Copenhagen um, FC in, in, in Copenhagen, um, who are champion league perennial performance. So um, there, was, uh, there were some uh, outstanding moments. And, and, and as a person... Um, it made me grow up a, a lot quicker than probably what I what I was um, what I was go going to do. So, um, great question. So, on that note, and since we're talking about Norway, Campbell Tanner has also asked a question: uh, Did you get homesick? Mm. Yeah, and, and look, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, for everyone out there, I landed on the ground and I had an outstanding preseason, absolutely outstanding, and. By the start of the season, which was around March, April, I think of, of um, probably 2004, I was the starting left back at Lillestrøm Football Club, which was a dream. So I was overseas, I was earning my spot. What happened throughout that first three or four months, my form dipped. And I probably hadn't experienced competition or a squad with so much strength here in Australia. I was playing week in, week out. So I was very happy in myself. And as we know, as sports people or as footballers, we always want to play. Unfortunately, by the summer of 2004, I'd lost my position. And I was then having to go back and play uh, second division, basically reserve football, which wasn't easy, which wasn't easy. So you just had a, I'd had the highs of making debuts and everything going well to the now, to the challenges, to the first challenge. And that was trying to win my spot back. It got even worse, and I shouldn't say worse, but... By, by the September of that year, I still was on the bench, basically. And by then, and this is when us Australians do definitely get homesick, but in Europe, by September and October, it starts to get drizzly. 
rainy, cold again. And that were the times that I was really missing Brisbane, really missing home, really missing my family because I'd went over there to play football. I'd went over there to play week in, week out, which I wasn't doing. And you know what? It was a reflection on me as a footballer because I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to play, to play week in, week out. Um, in, in all honesty, it actually took me 18 months, 18 months in, in, in my current club, Lillistrum, to, to, to win or to earn uh, a starting spot um, and play in week in, week out. It actually took me till probably midway through my second season in Norway before I regained my starting spot. But from then on, I was, I was playing week in, week out. I was probably playing some of the best football that I'd ever played. Um, and as a person, it, it had really strengthened me. It strengthened my uh, mental ability, like we talk about, that mental toughness that I had to get through. And I was loving what I was doing. I was a professional footballer um, on weekends, long weekends. And this is something around the life experience. Me and my wife, we could fly across to Paris. Um, my sister was in London. I'd go across and watch Fulham play at Craven Cottage or Crystal Palace play or, or our Premier League game. It was, it was, it was outstanding. But as we see now in, in, in a lot of professional sport or specifically in football, Australians that are going to Europe, it's not easy. A lot of people... Um, or not, not a lot of people, but um, people don't understand how difficult it is. And, and I have a, a, a true understanding when players do return after 18 months of being in Europe and people say, well, why didn't you stick it out? Very, very much easier said than done, guys, when, 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 it's, when, when they haven't uh, been successful. It, it is difficult, that's for sure. So moving on, you've mentioned three players from, the, uh, from Brisbane Roar and about their journeys. And, and I guess there are some common threads that link players who achieve excellence. Uh, what they do makes them stand out from others with potentially the same um, skill set, but not necessarily the same mindset. So I, I guess I wanted to get you to talk through what are some of the similarities between those three players? Hmm, I, think, I think we've just um, spoken about myself, about non-selection. Um, we've spoken about Dylan, about not earning a professional contract, um, let's say the first time around. Um, we've probably talked about Matt Mackay not being as successful as he would have wanted to be at Rangers, a massive football club, of course. You know, so we all have, have setbacks along the way, whether, whether those setbacks begin at um, 13, like we're saying, non-selection of not making a, a Queensland uh, state team or not making at 15s a, a Joey's national side or, or, or not even being selected in the starting eleven. Um, for a club side. So we, we all have those uh, setbacks uh, uh, along the way. Um, it is important uh, that you always refocus. Um, it's important uh, that you learn from those moments. And, and it's important that you continue to try and work hard and improve um, so that you can bounce back um, bigger, bigger and better. Um, I guess for myself, um, which we haven't probably spoken about yet in terms of setback, um, you know, I, I had a, after finishing in Europe, um, I'd come back to the North Queensland Fury. Um, being a Cairns boy, I wanted to sign for my local club, let's call it, or the local club in my area. Um, seven games in, uh, I, I ruptured my cruciate ligament um, in my left knee. Now, the timing of that could not have been worse, worse because in September 2009, I played my third ever game uh, for the Australian national team against Korea in Korea. Um, the next summer was going to be the 2010 World Cup. Uh, you couldn't get a worse time for me as a footballer um, to have a setback. Um, and I guess it's some of the toughest times that I, have to, that, that I had to go through. Um, but again, that refocusing was exactly what um, my goal was. And to this day, um, I say that when I come back from my... ACL, my knee was bigger and better and stronger than it ever had been. Um, but what it was, was me being diligent and me being professional and me being doing everything to the best of my ability and then some. You know, if I had to do three sets of 10 uh, leg press on my left knee, I'd do three sets of 12 and I'd do three sets of 12 on my right. You know, if I had to do 90 minutes on the bike, um, I'd do 95 minutes on the bike and then I'd do a 15 minute warm down. Um, you know, I was always making sure that I was doing, going above and beyond um, what I had to do uh, because in the belief that when I did come back, 
I wanted, I, I didn't want to, to drift off into the sunset. Um, I wanted to, to, to be even more successful. And thankfully, in 2010, uh, a guy by the name of Ange Foster Cogley was um, rebuilding, let's call it, the Brisbane Royal Football Club. And um, I was part of his plans. And I guess, as we've already mentioned, um, the rest is history, really. And so that leads us well into being prepared. Um, you were certainly prepared, not only um, with for your games, but also in training. Yeah, and Stu, I want to come back to that pyramid where we had the elite, the excellence, um, you know, the fun kind of period pyramid. And I've actually done it where my pyramid, and I've just written it down in some notes. Now, my pyramid as a, as a sports person preparing well is is this. The foundation is the key, as we know. The foundation of every, any building of any footballer is the key. So I, I break it down into four key areas. Diet, sleep patterns, training load, and preparation. These are the four things. If you can get right, gives you an outstanding foundation. Now, the, the key with these four things, they're in, we are in control of these four things. What we eat, how long we sleep for at night, how prepared we are for training, how much training we do or how hard we work at training, that's all within each and every one of us. We have, we have the ability to dictate these key terms. And then once we get this foundation right, then we can start look at performing at a consistent high level. We can start looking at mental toughness and being able to perform under pressure. And then, of course, once we get all these decision-making, like we've spoken about, we haven't touched on as much, but once we get our decision-making process correct, we then can be elite. We can be elite and we can be at the top of that pyramid. Um, but remember, the foundation is something that we all have the ability to, to guide ourselves and to be a destiny... De of our own future. And then the next area you talk about is your ability to learn as a player. Yeah, and I guess this is, uh, I, I guess this is a, again, I believe this is something that we all continually uh, develop over our careers. It's not something we are instinctively uh, born with, but it's something we can improve on um, over time. And I guess it's, it's, it's when we're listening to coaches, when we're able to take criticism on board, even if we don't agree with, what, what, with potentially what's being said. Um, the ability to reflect on our performances and see what we did well and see what we didn't do so well. Now, also being able to move on from a bad day at the office. We all have bad days at the office. Um, and we will continue to have bad days at the office. But if we dwell on these too long, it can be quite simply counterproductive, in my opinion. And all three of the players here, Matt Mackay, an outstanding professional. And I mean, everything he did was at a high standard. If any setback that he would have had he was able to deal with that and move on quickly. Um, someone like Dylan obviously has to overcome adversity, let's say, but understand that when he gets another opportunity, he learns from his previous um, opportunity in a program and knows what he has to do better this time um, to obviously succeed. And even that little things like having a little bit more, and I'm, I hope it doesn't offend anyone, but a little bit more mongrel, um, a little bit more um, want to, to, to be the best, you know, and, and that's probably what Dylan now has. Um, and, and, and I guess myself was, was more about, I was never the most talented footballer. And I, to my day, I was never going to be the most talented footballer. But what I was going to be um, good at was being able to make the most of the ability I had. Um, was the making the most of all those things that I had control of, like I've just spoken to you about, diet, sleep, uh, preparation, training. You know, it was probably detriment to me in the later years of my career, 
I didn't know when to maybe pull it back a bit and go at 80 or 90% into a, instead of 100% all the time. And that cost me some soft tissue injuries, hamstring injuries, calf problems, because I wanted to go as hard as I could for as long as I could, whether that was at training or whether that was in a game. And, and, and sometimes I guess I could have learned a little bit more about my body, but again, I, I wouldn't change it if I had it over. And then you, you've talked about this a little bit, but you uh, went on further. Um, you certainly believe that good decision-making is a key part of a, of a good athlete. Yeah, it's not key, it's crucial. Um, you know, if I can say it, at any level of sport, um, being able to make good decisions and me being made, able to make good decisions under stressful situations, under fatigue. You know, I think as young footballers, we see a match and let's say a football match and it gets a bit scrappy sometimes at 60 or 70th minute. Your passing accuracy might be a little bit off or your, um, again, your performance may dip a bit and that's quite simply that we're fatigued up here and it does affect um, our decision, uh, making good decisions, you know, and, and that's what I think coaches are always saying, you know, being able to make good decisions and sports people or footballers that are able to make good decisions are normally ones that are that are performing at a high level and, and normally the ones that um, are being, uh, uh, I guess, successful. But um, you have to be able to give yourself that freedom to fail. Um, you have to take um, responsibility for the good decisions and the bad decisions. And look, let's be honest, guys, I, I, I try to say, me as a, as a sports person, I made plenty of mistakes. I made plenty of mistakes about my routine as a young footballer, not getting it right. I probably learned more about my preparation as I got older. Um, you know, I learned more about uh, that, uh, that mental uh, toughness that I required or even uh, to the point where, um, you know, I probably played the game in my mind before the game had even started, which that anxiety and pressure builds, builds up so much that you don't perform um, probably as, 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 as well as you'd hoped. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's always something that you need to evaluate. It's always something that you need to try and work on. And it's always something that you need to try and improve on. It's one of the toughest skills um, in, in professional sport. And I say this whether you're a, a rugby league player, whether you're a golfer, um, whether, you, whether you're playing tennis, um, whether you're a footballer, um, whether you're track and field. You know, it's, it, it, it is relative to every sport. And on that note, the idea of making good decisions, in order to make good decisions, you have to at least make a number of bad decisions. And that freedom to fail is really important, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. I think, um, yeah, it's not even a freedom to, uh, to fail. It's, it's more so about being um, willing to try. You know, it, it's, it's, it's nothing worse, um, in my opinion, um, than seeing a, a, a footballer specifically that isn't willing to try and play that um, killer pass sometimes because of the fear of giving the ball away. Um, but if you're working within your structure and you're working within your team philosophy, um, trying to play that through ball, whether it comes off or doesn't come off, I would rather see someone try and do that than playing the safe option of going back to your goalkeeper, let's say. That, that, that is just a, an example of um, sometimes how frustrating it can be for a coach um, to, 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 to probably have um, a player that is brave. It's bravery. It is bravery sometimes um, to be able to, because you know what? You might have given the, the last three balls away. So you, you're going on, you going on, you get the ball again on the fourth time. Hopefully you want the ball still. And you see that strikers on, in on goal, if you play that pass. Now, what do you do? Do you try and play it? Maybe, maybe it goes over the byline and it goes out for a goal kick. Okay. But I'd rather see someone try it on that fourth time. That's for sure. The, the common theme, and people talk about it, the secret of success, and it's not really a secret, is hard work, hard work, hard work. But it seems to be the one that most people struggle with. Yeah, and isn't it interesting that I guess, you know, everyone on this, this call today, I'm sure, has, has heard more than me say, look, look, let's be honest. If you want to be elite, uh, if you want to be successful and you're not willing to work hard, then you might as well forget it now, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's as honest as I can be. Um, 
think of it like I spoke before, a small percentage will make it to the top. Um, to the point where my, um, my youth team, um, which was from, again, I started in 96 and I probably finished in about 98. I think there was potentially three of us that transitioned um, into a professional contract with the Brisbane Strikers. Now, during that time, there would have been between 40 and 50 minimum footballers that come through that system uh, that all wanted to be elite, um, but for whatever reason, uh, didn't make it. Uh, so if you're not willing or you're not wanting uh, to work as hard as your body can possibly push, and to the point where you nearly need to be a bit selfish here, and you need to, nearly need to be working harder, in my opinion, than every other competitor, every other um, person you come up against, every other, in all honesty, sometimes every other teammate. Um, it, it, it is a ruthless world, um, and, and, and I guess that's probably being a little bit too honest with everyone, but uh, professional sport, um, is, it, it, it's, it's, it, it gives people so much, but it also, there is an understanding there that it is not easy um, to get to the top, and, and that's why, because um, for those people that do make it, um, they have worked really hard along the way. So talking about working hard, we talk about working hard at training at the game, um, but there's more than that, isn't it? When we talk about extras, for example, when your coach asks you to look into a certain type of or philosophy within your sport, or your coach asks you to fill out a, uh, a eating plan, or your coach asks you to do something that doesn't seem like part of your sport, but it's essential in your growth and you don't do it, then that's failing in this aspect, isn't it? It's failing in hard work because it's not just on the pitch and it's not just at training. Yeah, you're probably letting yourself down to be, to, in, in all honesty, you, you, you're letting yourself down. If, you, if you're dedicating and, uh, uh, so much time um, and effort um, to trying to be the best, um, it would be disappointing if the little one percenters, as we talk about, if the little one percenters are the things that are letting you down. You know, if your eating habits, um, if your sleep patterns, um, if your training standards, um, are not as good as they probably can be, um, you know, and that's, that's probably the disappointment. Uh, I mean, I, I'll just digress a little bit here, but to the point where my routine before a game got to the point where I was so meticulous in what I was doing probably two or three days out from a game, um, was there, was there was really no flexibility in it. I was eating same, similar foods, I was sleeping as much as I could, to, to be honest, where I was going to bed at 8.30 at night, to be honest. And I was sleeping through the, you know, we had early training sessions, but I was probably, um, you know, sleep until, until 6.30 in the morning. On game day, um, I used to go to bed at probably 9 p.m. the night before, and I'd nearly sleep until 9 a.m. in the morning. Um, I would then have my game day routine of breakfast, same breakfast pretty much always same lunch pretty much always and you'll love this I then used to have an afternoon sleep as well you know I used to try and have an hour in the afternoon before my pre-match meal and then I was off to the stadium and, and that's how um, I guess meticulous that I'd broken down my preparation because I knew that when I got out onto Suncorp Stadium on a Saturday night I felt bulletproof nearly I felt that I'd given myself the best possible opportunity um, to, to, to perform at the highest possible uh, standard. Now, sometimes I would do all that and I'd have a stinker or the, the, the winger would get the better of me that day. So that, that's always going to happen. But I had a belief in what I was doing was correct for me and it's for me, you know, because everyone will be different of how they prepare. But when, when I got the formula right or what I thought was a formula, I would just replicate over and over again. So it leads us to our, I guess we've, we've heard of some of the good behaviours and it leads us to our next poll, which is what good behaviours, and let's see if we can make technology work and it's worked, what good behaviour do you need to work on the most? And I say this, uh, these polls will come up with percentages, so don't worry, you, you won't, the names won't be attached to them. But it's really interesting for us to know, based on what Shane's talked about, um, where, where the hurt points are as far as an athlete goes. Now, 
Shane, while that's going, I have got a question, and this question was actually written uh, exactly one week ago. Uh, it was 3.30 one week ago by none other than Mr. Martin Doherty, who I believe you know, and he's, he's a bit of a legend in football. He says, Shane, you lived in the country, uh, Cairns, as a child, and you moved to Brisbane to pursue your dream to become a professional football player. Given the same scenario, would you do it again? And what advice would you give to a country player and their family thinking on doing the same thing right now? And this actually reflects a, a question that just came through from Griffin Coleman. And he says, and perhaps you can answer these questions together, would it be beneficial to move closer to the big cities to be noticed as a player? Yes, they're very, Griffin and Martin's questions are, are, are very good questions, actually. And I guess everyone has to, I guess, answer them for themselves. Um, first part of it, given the scenario, would I do it again? Of course I would. Uh, of course I would. Um, I can't underestimate or understate um, the sacrifice that my family did give for me. So that sometimes is not something that every family can do. It, it may not be possible for both parents to give up or a parent to give up their, their job and support a sports person um, in their dream of becoming a professional. Um, do I believe that it is beneficial in coming to the big smoke or, or, or further south? Um, you need to be where you're gonna be challenged. And that's, that's my belief. Wherever that is, um, that's where you need to, to be. Um, probably or potentially um, in the Southeast Queensland corridor, there can be, um, I guess, a little bit more opportunity. Um, the standard of competition can be a little bit higher. Um, I, I'm all, always a believer that a talented sports person will make it uh, one way or the other. And as we've spoken about, um, during different, we can take different pathways to get to where we need to be. And, and that isn't necessarily having to, to move family, um, uh, you know, into the Southeast Corridor um, to become a professional sports person. Because I do know, and I, I must admit, I'll, I'll be honest with this, I do know families that have uh, moved down for sport and haven't, made it to the top so so for every story i guess like myself um who was fortunate enough to make it um there probably is a story of someone that did the same uh but didn't make it and um it's 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 you know like i was saying it's it's sport is a wonderful thing it gives us so much joy um but there can also be um so much uh, disappointment that comes with it but don't forget now in terms of families having to relocate to, let's say, the Southeast Corridor, not necessarily anymore. There can be boarding schools, um, school programs can, can support now. Um, I guess you young generation um, teens, let's call you, um, are also probably able to move away from home at a, a younger age and maybe even um, be with a host family, let's say. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of... Footballers in this um, call will will know, or if you don't know, the stories of someone like Tim Cale, um, Lucas Neal, uh, that all moved or all had to go to the UK as 15, 16, 14, 15, 16 year olds um, for their dream of becoming a professional sports person. And, um, you know, fair play to them because I don't know about yourself, but me as a 14 or a 15 year old, uh, I'd be lucky to be able to... Um, move out of my uh, move out of my state let alone uh, move out of uh, a country and go to a foreign place to to take up a dream it, it, they're not easy decisions um, but I guess everyone has to assess um, what's possible and what, what's beneficial for them so we've now we'll now end the poll and you should see the results coming up and there we go. So the number one response was recovery from setbacks, which could be expected, and then preparation. But it's all pretty much across the board, isn't it, Shane? There's a, there's a lot there that people are identifying with as far as what good behaviours. Um, it, it's, Stu, it's, it's most interesting for me that it's pretty even across everyone what they're saying. And, I mean, I, I would say 
what good behaviours do you need to work on? You need to work on all of the above there, you know, realistically. I know it's a cliche or whatever, but all those things that you've made points of are, are very valid. And, and, it's, and I would think as sportsmen or sports people, that we over time will all have to work on those those key points along the way at some stage in our careers. All right. So we might keep moving because um, you mentioned the 50 players that potentially the strikers um, that didn't make it. And this is, I guess, dedicated to those people who nearly made it. And there's a number of reasons. I mean, injury can be one of them. But I guess what we're talking about is the nearly made it, the person who was there but couldn't quite make it because of their their mindset and you you didn't select a player for this did you and, and there's obviously good reasons why yeah and and i mean it's me as a in my current role as football director and it was even me as as a footballer there is nothing more frustrating than seeing some someone or a young sports person who has ability they have speed they have physical capacity um they have all the traits, let's call it, to be successful or be the best, but they don't have that work ethic. They don't have that, that instinctive hard work uh, ability that you require. And, and you know what it, it does show, and, and I'll be honest with this again, in my era or in my age group, the kids that were the best at 12 were not the best at 16. Unfortunately, the kids at 12 that were always the best didn't have to work as hard as some of us to get to the top. And so they become a little bit too relaxed and I guess, you know, a little bit too comfortable to be honest. And unfortunately as young men, we all develop at different rates, but we all even out at some time. And that is where in the end, it all evens out at some stage. And that's probably in the years of 16, 17, 18, let's be honest. And that's where I believe you'll, you'll, you'll reap the benefits of all the hard work you've probably put in over the years. Um, Stuart, I will put someone out there, and, and he, he's, he's, a, he's an excellent footballer, um, and he plays for Sydney FC at the moment, and it's Luke Bratton. And he was a teammate of mine when I first got to Brisbane in 2010. And at the time, he could have been one to be that, that, that was in the category of nearly made it. Now, unfortunately for Luke, he, was a li he had issues with his health, which was setting him back. He didn't have any issues with his ability. He was lucky as if you know him now, he's one of the best passers in the A-League um, and he's one of the best footballers in the A-League now. But at the time in 2010, he was behind someone like Eric Pardalou, Massimo Madoka, Matt Mackay. And, um, you know, senior pros that were outstanding in what they were doing and for Luke I think there was maybe a time period there between 2010 and 2013 where it could have went either way for him um, thankfully he pushed through I think he was part of a, a, a championship winning side in the third one for us and then the rest is history for him now because he's gone on and played you know he went and signed for Manchester City um, I think he was loaned out to, to Bolton um, he's also, you know, been at Melbourne City and you know, he's one of the key key players, as I said, for, for Sydney FC at the moment. So it could have been a nearly made it moment for someone like Luke Clark. So you, you talk about some of the behaviours and we'll go through this quickly because uh, we both like a cat and we try to finish it too, but we might go about 10 minutes over and that's okay. Uh, it's mm -hmm. really good information. So the first part you talk about, I guess, is cutting corners. Yeah, well, you, yeah. let's be honest. I, I love today that we've got 44 people here that have taken the time um, to take an hour out of their day to basically listen to me and a little bit Stuart waffle on about our, or my beliefs, basically. Now, if you're willing to cut corners, then you might as well forget it now. Um, I'm not saying, and, and also I should come back to this as well, there is a time and a place for relaxation and to freshen your mind and your body. So don't think that I'm saying to each and every one of you that you have to train five days a week, um, 52 weeks of the year. Don't, don't, think, don't think that at all for, for a second. But if you're not willing to when you're uh, in preparation, pre-season, 
season, if you're if you're willing if you're willing to cut corners, um, then I think it, personally um, you're doing yourself a disservice. But you're also you're not going to get the best out of yourself, and and, and that's the that's the truth um, of it. Um, I, I will share a little bit more uh, information about me as a as a footballer. Uh, when I came back to the A League. Um, when I come back from my ACL, when I went to Brisbane, um, I was 30. So as a footballer, um, ancient, basically, um, over the hill many times, uh, some journalists would call me. But what I did know is that we used to get a five-week holiday period. And I would religiously, and every year, I'd take 10 to 12 days off. I would, I'd, I'd take my family to Fiji. I'd go to Hawaii. I'd go somewhere nice and warm. And I'd do nothing for 10 to 12 days. I would eat all the food I love, hot chips, um, icy drinks, um, you name it. I, I, would, I would sit on the beach loving life. But what I would do from day 13 until first day of pre-season, I would do my own program. I would go and run. I would go and um, be active. I would make sure that on the day, first day of pre-season when I came back in, that the coach saw me and saw how good shape I was in to put me top of the queue in terms of him knowing that he could, one, rely on me, and two, that I was motivated to be successful again. And I probably believe that that's why I was able to play until I was 36 and a half years old, which is, um, you know, like a dinosaur in football world these days. So, um, but they're they're just some of the the little tips or, or, or the trade. But don't think that guys as uh, sports people and as young people um, you shouldn't be enjoying life and you shouldn't be having a mental and physical break when 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 you're told to we talk about the uh, failing under pressure we mentioned about freedom to fail before um, you should be willing to fail but you need to be able to um, learn from it I guess yeah, and, and again, it's 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 you know what it's it's so easy to say, it's so easy to talk about, it's so easy to um, I guess um, you know dealing with pressure. You know, we just say oh, you just got to deal with pressure, but um, none of us are really. Um, it's not like school where you get taught how to do it. You know, you really have to learn it for yourself. Um, you, you really have to figure out um, how how you will will deal with. Um, failing under pressure. Like we've spoken about, you will have to, I guess, figure out um, how you're going to bounce back. Um, you will, each and every one of you, will have to deal about um, how you are going to forget about it quickly and move on. You know, the, easier said than done. Um, there's a lot of people that may want to talk to someone about it. There's a lot, a lot that just deal with it themselves. Um, there will be um, some that will rely on their coach, um, will rely on a mentor. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's various different ways, um, but you have to understand that along the way, um, there will be hurdles, um, there will be ups and downs. It, it's, it's not like no one's going to go like, uh, you, you know, just a, a beautiful um, line up, up, up and, you know, keep going up. Uh, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not how it goes. Um, you know, you, you would talk to uh, whether it's Wayne Rooney, Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, Lionel Messi, um, LeBron James, uh, Michael Jordan, you know, the, uh, Greg Norman, Tiger Woods, you know, they would have all had their ups and downs. Um, they would have all failed under pressure at some stage, uh, but they would have been able um, to work through it and come out on the other side uh, bigger and better. And that's what you need to focus on. It's, it's not failing under pressure that you need to dwell on. It's, it's coming out of it and being better for it. And then the, on the other spectrum, there's the play and it just doesn't care or can I say just doesn't appear to care in the eyes of the coaches, players or people around them? Yeah, no, I guess it's, look, I think, I think in, a, in a professional environment, I think everyone cares. So I don't think there's anyone that doesn't care. Um, my, my, probably my biggest gripe and, and I see it, um, we talk about um, a strong culture um, and we talk about um, uh, groups that build good culture and from what I've learned, um, you don't always have to be friends. You don't always have to get along with every single teammate. But what you do need, you need everyone pulling in the same direction. And therefore, the, the key word is buy-in. 
You need everyone to be buying in to a team philosophy, um, a playing style or whatever it might be. It's sometimes even as a player, we're not always going to agree or we're going to not always get on with our coach, but we always have to back what we're trying to do as a team and as a group. Um, we always have to buy in because, again, we're only as strong as our weakest link. Excellent. So we, we've, we've talked about not being a team player. The next poll question, and we'll be really quick about this one, is, again, getting, play, getting everyone today to reflect or think about uh, what area um, of bad behaviour do you think you can work on the most and understand that you need to work on all of them, but what's one area that you might identify with um, that you think you need work on? So we'll launch that poll. It'll come up. So while we're doing that, we might ask a few of the questions that have come out and a new challenge to you. Um, let's see if you can answer a question in 30 seconds. You ready? Okay. Okay. Go. What go. food diet would you suggest for growing athletes? I think, like I said, but everyone's got to work out what's best for them. Uh, for me, I was, I was big on carbohydrates, um, 48 hours loading up before a game. I'd have pastas, rice, uh, beefs, uh, I'd have low fat. Um, Post-match, but I'd, I'd eat a burger, I'd eat pizza um, because I wanted to refuel. And I, I felt that always as a professional sportsman, I wasn't that hungry post a match, but I knew that I needed to get fuel back into my body. So sometimes, even if it was KFC or if it was a Big Mac or if it was a slice of pizza, it was better for me to be eating something than nothing at all. So um, everyone needs to figure out what uh, works for them. But you obviously have to have a good balanced diet. You need. To, um, I love my fruit, so I've always been a big eater of fruit. So that's been uh, beneficial for me. And also, as I got older, I enjoyed more vegetables. I've always loved meat and I'm a, t a part Italian, so pastas and stuff have always been part of, part of my diet because of Numa's pasta sauce. So just a little bit over 30 seconds. Uh, Liam Ponting, uh, does your physical size affect how well you develop? Does, my, does your physical side affect how... I guess how you play, uh, whether you, how you develop in football or in your sport? Um, no, because I think now more and more coaches are looking at if you're not the biggest kid, but you're technically the best, they're going to support you. They're going to put time into you. So I think it's important to have a balance of both. So you've got to be able to be an athlete, which is you've got to have capacity to be able to run a game out, let's be honest. But you also need to now, you have to have good decision-making process, as we've spoken about. If you're a good decision-maker, normally you can play good football. And then... Technically, you need to be good. You need to be able to use both feet or you need to be able to throw a pass with both hands. Um, you know, you need to be all doing those technical things at a very high level, in my opinion, um, no matter what size you are. Okay, the poll has ended and let's check out the results. And the results are interesting. 61% um, say that they're, they, they struggle with uh, being under pressure or failing under pressure. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all because uh, a lot of, uh, I guess, the, the participants on this line are probably young, young sportsmen. And, and you know what? If, if you would have asked me that question at 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, probably even into my early 20s or mid-20s, um, I would have struggled with it at times as well. Um, you know, like I was saying, they're, they're just things that you continually have to try and work through, but you need to move on as quick as you can. You need to address it, deal with it, uh, move on and get out the be the other side bigger and better. Okay, so you want to give us a recap on what we've uh, talked about today? I, I guess, you know, my key recap, guys, and this is when I've been speaking to Stuart, is about pathway. Um, my pathway was, was different um, to a lot of other um, pathways uh, that, that we, would, we would expect a footballer today. Um, sometimes my pathway is, is more difficult as well and a bit more sacrifice in that my family had to move uh, for my uh, future. Um, so I, but I just wanted to reiterate that there are, the new generation we are in with professional sport, there is more than one way to make it now. If, if, you fail, or if you don't make it one way, that you can turn left or right and you can still make it to the top. So don't, don't give up there. Um, I, I'm a big believer. I'm a big believer only because of my, myself as point in case of not being the most naturally gifted athlete that ever ever played um, 
a game um, that you need to continually work hard. You need to continually try and be the best you can be. And that's why I spoke about that pyramid about getting a good base. Um, it's, it's very easy, and I see this as my, uh, being a father right now, that for my daughter to stay on her phone until 10.30 at night. Um, it's not great, guys, when, uh, you know, if you're going to school, and I know a lot of you would have an early start to get to school when it goes back to school, you know, it's not good to be able to, to be going to bed at 10.30 at night and having to wake up at 6.30 in the morning. It's, it, it's not great, you know. That's why I'm saying we have to be disciplined and we have to make sacrifices about those key areas, about our diet, about our sleep prep, uh, sleep patterns, about our preparation, about our training. We, we have to get those. If we can get those foundations right, we give ourselves the best chance to succeed. So when we look at it from, a, from what we've talked about today, again, we don't cut corners. We don't fail under pressure. We try not to fail under pressure. We, be a poor, we try not to be a poor teammate and we don't be careless or show a, a persona of carelessness. We try to practice good decision making, recover from setbacks, prepare well, and be willing to learn and work hard. That pretty much sums it up. And I guess we are in for some uh, fast questions. If you've got some questions, oh. quickly uh, put them up now. And Ten seconds, uh, yeah. yeah, let's see how we go. So it's, let, let's, I can't time you because I can't get the stuff on there, but let's go. Do you need to know someone to make it? Um, or is your skill and hard work enough? And that's from Declan Warns. Yeah, I think Declan, I don't think you need to know someone to, to make it. I think you need to make the most of opportunities that come your way. You know, I mean, if, you, if you're at an a identification series, let's be honest, you have a good, good tournament and, and in the eyes of coaches, um, you might be elevated in their, their, their thought process. So um, I think it's a matter of making the most of the opportunities that come along, you know, and, and taking taking those opportunities because even in my career there were there were key moments for me um, that come along um, and and I probably did oh, excuse me make the most of those opportunities so still not 30 seconds but let's go okay. again um, from an anonymous attendee oh. um, did you go out partying oh, no wonder they're anonymous um, or doing anything non-productive at any time I'm gonna need more than 30 seconds but Everyone okay, out there. That's from your wife. <laughs> yeah. But look, and, and this is truth, hand on heart. This is the truth. Like when I moved to Brisbane, right, Southeast Queensland um, in 96, I was in year 11. And as we know, um, as year 11 and 12 students, every Friday night and Saturday night, there's something happening. Now, my Queensland Academy of Sport game was either a Saturday or potentially Saturday or Sunday. So uh, the party was on Friday nights. There were times, and, and again, when um, I guess girlfriends come along and things like that, and they're not influencing you, but they're asking you to come to a party on a Friday night. And again, when we come back to our preparation, um, you know, uh, if, if, if I'm not willing to sacrifice in those key moments, um, you know, I probably uh, wouldn't have succeeded. But, I, I, and I'll be brutally honest with all of you, there is a moment where you go, well, do I just want to be a normal um, teenager? And, and that's the truth of the matter. And you know what? I went to schoolies. Um, I did all those things um, that any teenager should do. Um, and I did party along the way, 100% of course I did. Um, I was lucky enough to be responsible enough that I could do it at the right time uh, when it didn't affect my, um, my, my career. So Shane Doherty wanted to ask one more question. Fantastic insight, Shane. Obviously, Shane um, Martin is responsible for coaching in Brisbane and he is a, a coaching mentor. So he wants to know, why aren't you moving into coaching? And, and Martin would know this and, and every coach knows this. You either have it or you don't have it when it comes to your passion for coaching. And um, a long time ago, I saw that that was not for me. Um, and, and you know what? I have an appreciation after working so closely with um, a couple of uh, coaches um, that I definitely uh, don't... Uh, I think their life is really difficult. They are so passionate about what they're doing and they love what they do. Um, but for me, uh, I actually believe it was probably a worse job than being a player, to be honest, at times. So, um, yeah, thank you, Martin, but uh, definitely not for me. So, how, And we've got two more questions. How does your physical size affect your development at all? Which I think you've answered that with Liam's question. Yep. Move on to what was your dream position? Because you did start as a striker. 
Yeah, and isn't that a good... Yeah, we spoke about this the other night, didn't we, Stuart? And um, look, I started as a striker, and I'm honest with that. I, I, was a, I was a striker as a young footballer. I was probably a striker until I was about 14 years or 13 or 14 years of age. I then got moved back as a central midfielder, uh, which I enjoyed. I enjoyed because uh, at the time in my early teens, I was a, I was a cross-country runner and I liked my um, athletics. And so my cardio capacity was quite was quite high, so I could get up and down the field. So central midfield really did um, uh, suit me. Um, that's probably where I had the best tournament of my career as a 16-year-old when I got identified for the Queensland Academy of Sport was actually as a central midfielder. But as I got into competition for that position, I probably wasn't skillful enough, if I'm honest. I wasn't a, a good enough passer. You couldn't just, you know, you couldn't just... I guess, get away with just being a good runner. So I got moved out to the left. I am a left footer. I'm blessed that I was a left footer. I, I don't think, as I said, if some people, I'm honest, I wouldn't have probably made it if I was a right footer, to be honest with you, because I don't think I was talented enough. I was a left footer. I got moved out onto the left wing back role. I got moved back to a left back position and, that, and that's what suited me. And I'm thankful for the coaches that saw that in me. Excellent. Okay, so Shane, thank you. Uh, it's, I think we've, uh, it's about time to wrap up. And uh, Shane, thank you so much for participating in this. It's been really good. I hope that you, like the listeners, got something out of today's webinar. Even if it is a single, simple message, something that you'll be able to put into your tool bag as you continue on your journey in sport, that will be vital. Um, our next webinar will be with Warren Moon, who is the Brisbane Roar Academy General Manager. And trust me, you will not want to miss this one, Shane. Thank you so much for giving your time today. It's been awesome. Thanks, Stuart. And well done to yourself for making this possible in these difficult times. So um, you're doing a great job, mate, and it was my pleasure. Thank you very much, guys. We'll see you next week. Hope you can join us for Warren Moon.